Okay, thank you so much. Um, I had the distinct pleasure of working at the Committee for Responsible Proto Budget this summer with Mike Murphy, who was one of our esteemed panelists tonight. And it was through this experience that I was able to better appreciate the people facing and affecting outcomes of what we are here to talk about tonight. This will not be proportionally felt, but it will affect everyone. Um, also in attendance tonight is Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, class of 78. Thank you so much for coming back once again. And then we also have as our Q&A moderator, Professor Rose of the Economics Department, a senior lecturer and a regular consultant for the IMF, and who also comes to events and panels events like this all across campus. We are incredibly excited and incredibly lucky to have her tonight. Please join me in welcoming Professor Rose. Um, thanks so much, Quinn. Well, good afternoon. Actually, it looks like good evening at this point. Um, on behalf of the Rockefeller Center, um, I'd also like to especially welcome Senator Robert Portman for making time in his extremely busy schedule. I hear you're all over the state these days um, to be part of this event. And Professor Portman was um, like not a lone voice, but one of the few voices when, uh, at, uh, during his time on Capitol Hill for pushing for um, fiscal responsibility. So it's great to have him as part of this event. And I also want to thank our students and our faculty and community members um, for your participation um, in important events like this one. And none of this could have happened without the support of Joanne Blay on the Rockefeller Center um, and direct, supported by director, director Jason Barabas. Yes, thank you. Lots of moving parts to, to an event like this. The issue of large and growing US fiscal deficits and the related mountain of debt they create is certainly not a new one. Um, but it's become even more significant and serious in the recent decade. Despite this trajectory, it seems like few Americans are really aware of or even understand the basic problems with these fiscal deficits and the debt they create. You know, I, was, I teach macro, and I cover this topic every time I teach macro, um, but I was really curious sort of on campus at large, what do Dartmouth students think or are they aware of um, the issues with the US fiscal deficit? So two days ago, I went around with my cell phone and I just asked a bunch of random students, freshmen to seniors, science, non-science majors, what they thought about the fiscal deficit. And this is the response that I got. A few of the responses. Yeah, I think like talking about the debt and losing 
Well, maybe you can relate to some of their responses. Uh, maybe you don't know what to think about the U.S. fiscal deficit and our, our mountain of debt. Um, we're very fortunate today to have two leaders in the fiscal responsibility arena. Um, and they're, I'm sure, going to enlighten it and inform us. And hopefully after today, we'll all be able to more effectively answer that question. Bob Bixby is the executive director of the Concord Coalition and has been an informed and passionate advocate for fiscal responsibility since the early 1990s. The Concord Coalition is a very important nonpartisan organization in Washington which aims to encourage sustainable fiscal policy and help educate the public about the federal budget. In particular, Bob and his colleagues are concerned about the dangers of excessive government debt for the future of our younger generations, our current Dartmouth students. I first met Bob when he was part of the uh, fiscal wake-up tour more than, I think it was a decade ago, um, and that tour was featured in the documentary IOUSA, um, and I, it's, it's, I just checked, it's available online at some point, if, I know we all like to binge, at some point, check on YouTube and watch IOUSA. Um, it's very entertaining and informative, and even though it was produced a while ago, it's still relevant uh, to today. Um, the other expert we have is Mike Murphy, who is Senior Vice President and Chief of Staff of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, that's a mouthful, um, or the CRFB, as it's commonly known. Um, it's another important and influential nonpartisan organization in Washington. In addition to managing the research and analysis there, Mike is also director of Fix Us, or Fix US, um, which seeks to understand the growing political divisions and to build support for necessary change. That seems like a precondition for any fiscal policy reform. Mike has been deep in the fiscal policy arena for some time, including working on David Walker's Come Back America initiative to educate the public about our looming fiscal problems. Rock, Rocky actually sponsored a talk with David Walker about a decade ago, I think Bob Bixby was also involved with that um, as part of that campaign. We are both so lucky, um, all of us, to have them here today. Let's please give a warm Dartmouth welcome for our special guests, Bob and Mike. Well, we'll see if you're still applauding after you've seen my charts. I guess I don't need this. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with my, uh, my microphone. Thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's very good to be here, and uh, I want to thank the uh, Rockefeller Center for inviting us, and uh, Marjorie, thank you. It's good to be with my friend and colleague, uh, Mike Murphy. We've done a lot of traveling together over the years on various uh, debt tours, and I want to say hello to Senator Rob Portman, who was part of our fiscal wake-up tour. He actually was OMB director at the time. Uh, that's the president's budget director and came out to Ohio to do an event with us at the John Glenn School of Public Policy, which was made all the more special because John Glenn himself was uh, still there and was able to join us on the panel. So Senator Portman, thank you uh, for being here. Um, you know, Warren Rudman, who uh, was a former New Hampshire senator and co-founder of the Concord Coalition, used to say we should we should do these events in the evening so everybody can adjourn and go to the bar. And uh, I, so I think the timing of tonight's event is, uh, is very, uh, very fortunate. What I hope to do is just set out um, an overview of, of the fiscal challenges facing the next administration. They really face all of us. They're really facing the nation. Uh, but uh, I wanted to you know, talk about not just the big budget deficit that we have now, but the important thing is the trends, the built-in trends that we have in the budget, understanding those trends, understanding why, uh, why they exist, and the possible options about doing something about it, and also the potential consequences if we don't, because the, the, the consequences are gonna play out more for younger people than they are for people my age which is why it's particularly important, even if you're not thinking about the debt, 
and the deficit right now I certainly understand, but if you're thinking about public policy in any sense, no matter what field of interest you have, it eventually is going to have to run through the budget. And so it does affect all of us, and no matter what part you know, you're interested in, so it's important now as public policy students to get some sense of what you're up against when it comes to federal funding and federal taxes. So let's begin with a slide on the, uh, um, this is just a freeze frame of the federal budget just to orient you with where we are now. Uh, it shows a federal budget deficit, that's the annual shortfall of $2 trillion last year, which was about a trillion dollars more than the deficit the year before. Yes, in other words, the deficit doubled last year. There were some anomalies uh, in that. It's not like the deficit doubles every year. But uh, we, I just, this will give you an idea of where the spending is in the budget and you know, where the revenues come from. And so that's, that's where we are right now. The deficit uh, was about 6% of GDP. We like to think of numbers in terms of measuring them against the economy because that's more relevant than just looking at dollar figures alone. To give you an idea of that, deficits over the past 50 years have averaged about 3.5% of GDP. So at 6% of GDP, this is not like a minor miss. I mean, we're way, we're into territory that's uh, way off the beaten track. Second point, a uh, really important point to make is that, you know, a lot of people know that we had really huge deficits the last couple of years because of the, the COVID pandemic. They were up over three trillion one year. So I think there's a tendency to think that, well, that's the problem, isn't it? We're talking about budget deficits in Washington. You know, we had the COVID pandemic and now that that is uh, easing uh, and the fiscal consequences of that are easing, we're going to go back to normal. Well, in that case, yes, as a matter of fact, we are going back to normal. The problem is that the normal is about that $2 trillion that I just showed you. So uh, the trajectory for the next president and for all of us is that, you know, we're going to have trillion dollar deficits for as far as the eye can see, uh, you know, looming into $2 trillion deficit. You don't have to go out 50 years to, to get the, uh, the gist of it. You know, even just going out 10 years, you've got budget deficits at astronomical levels. And it's because of some built-in structural reasons that I will uh, describe. For the economists in the room, uh, we always like to look at these things as a percentage of the economy. And uh, you know, the interesting thing about this chart is that it shows that we have tended to spend at about 20% of GDP and tax at about 17% of GDP, meaning we've tended to have deficits at about 3% of GDP. Now, if the economy is growing at about 3%, well, that's a sustainable situation. I might like a, a, something closer to a balanced budget, but you know, that would be a sustainable situation economically. What is happening now, and forget about this during the COVID, this is the important thing to look at, is that on autopilot, spending is growing faster than revenues. And so that's why you see these projected budget deficits increasing we're, uh, we're getting out of the, the norm here. So what is, uh, what's the, what, what, what are the things that are driving uh, spending, the, the sources of growth, as I like to call it? This is bad news politically. It's, uh, you can instantly understand this because the biggest drivers are uh, Social Security, Medicare, and other health care programs. Uh, there's an aging population, there's rising health care costs, this has nothing to do with you know, the being bad programs or Congress going on a spending spree. This is an underlying problem that's tied to the aging of the population, which we can't really do anything about you know, within socially acceptable norms, and with the uh, um, uh, rising of health care costs. But the other thing to keep in mind is, as we're running these huge budget deficits, we've got to pay interest on the rising debt. And so interest becomes an even bigger portion of the budget, it's, it's bigger than any programmatic part of the budget. And so you look out to these long-term projections that CBO does, and it's actually interest costs that become the uh, metastasizing cost, and we need to do things now so we don't, uh, so we don't you know, put the interest costs on a path to be as large as they are. 
Uh, we have one little glitch to, to talk about when we talk about revenue projections in the future. Uh, there is a, a glitch in the baseline that the next president is going to have to deal with. In 2017, tax cuts were enacted, uh, and a large part of those expire in 2025. So the uh, Congress and the next president are going to have to decide what to do with that. I bring that up for two reasons. One is the baseline projections from the Congressional office, Budget Office assume that in, at the end of 2025, those tax cuts are going to expire. I don't think that's a very sound political, decision, uh, political projection, uh, but CBO doesn't do politics. They just say what's in the law. So I think when we look at uh, revenue projections, it's, it's likely that the revenue baseline the next president is going to have to deal with, they're going to have to make a decision about this. But if you extend the tax cuts, uh, you're going to get less revenue than, than, um, uh, you know, than if you let them expire. It's important to remember that the, the assumption that they're going to expire is probably uh, somewhat uh, unrealistic. OK, I want to mention the, the, the demographics because this is really important. We talked a little bit about spending, a little bit about revenues. This all plays out against the economy. And there's, you know, some people say, well, I bet we can grow our way out of this. If we just have really robust growth of econo you know, economic growth, like 4% or 3.5%, why can't we do that? Well, there's an important factor going on. Demographics, the aging of the population, shouldn't hit the microphone, but the aging of the population is not just important for the budget because it runs up costs, but it's important for the economy as well, because people like me, baby boomers, are leaving the workforce, and so we have a much slower growing labor force, and that has very big effects on potential GDP growth, which feeds back into what you can expect on revenues and how much debt you can afford. So the bad news here is that you know the fiscal projections are bad, but the economic projections, if you look at projected economic growth, uh, it's only, you know, it's less than 2% when you go out a few years. Uh, that's real GDP growth. So we can't expect uh, a buoyant economy unless we can do something to uh, improve the, uh, the growth of the workforce or really, really boost productivity incredibly. And part of the problem that we've got now is the thing that, that gets squeezed in the budget, the discretionary spending, is... Um, is the things that sometimes go into investments like education and uh, workforce uh, participation, you know, you know, improving uh, productivity, goods and, and tools and, and factories and that sort of thing. So this is our problem here, why CBO says, you know, we can go from an average before of over 2% to less than 2%, 1.6%. That's an anemic economic growth but it's important to understand why that projection is being made. Uh, I take this one personally. It says that by 2052, the CBO projects that by 2052, there are gonna be more deaths than births in this country. I know what side of the equation I'm on in that category. <laughs> if I'm contributing to the other side, I'm gonna be the happiest man alive in something of a miracle, medical miracle. But at any rate, um, this is the problem we face, is that what do we do about the declining workforce? You know, you can try to get peop more people to participate. You can uh, have more babies. You can have uh, more immigrants. But we're going to have to do something to pick up uh, the workforce. So just, uh, we got a lot of problems, both on the, you know, spending side, the revenue side, and, uh, and the economic growth side. We have a debt that's on an unsustainable track. It's going to hit a record, it's projected to, by the end of the next president's next presidential term uh, within four years. Interest cost is going to be threatening at, uh, you know, as a record high uh, in 2031 as a percentage of the economy. And I haven't even mentioned that Social Security and Medicare trust funds are projected to be insolvent within about 10 years, which creates a bunch of problems policy challenge on its own, you can bet when those programs, when the trust funds run dry, for those programs and seniors are told they're going to have to have a 20% across the board cut, that's going to be a big, big issue. So there are many, many problems uh, facing the next administration, but I'm going to tell you, there really are problems. There are all of their problems, and I, I'm so glad to, to see all of you 
uh, come out because this is a, something that affects your generation. So when you assess you know, what you want to do and what you want to ask future presidential candidates, uh, this has got to be one of the issues that you talk about and you know, just let people know, I'm, I'm 20 and you know, or whatever, and I want to know what, what our country is going to look like when I'm 40 or 50, when things are projected to be uh, on an unsustainable track. So anyway, that's, uh, I'm, I'm going to turn things over to Mike, who will uh, depress you with uh, some numbers <laughs> of a different sort. Uh, and uh, so things don't get any better from here. But then we will, uh, we will go into the, uh, the, the Q&A. Thank you very much. We always bring up the mood at the places we go. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, I also want to thank Dartmouth so much for, for having us. Um, it's good to be with Bob again and, and Marjorie. It's great to be with you. I also want to thank Senator Portman, who is a true fiscal hero, uh, and we need more, a lot more like him. Um, I'm going to start off with a little, little story. So yesterday morning, when I was driving to the airport, um, I have a 11 and 9 year old boys. So I had to drop them off at elementary school on the way to the airport. Now I've been teaching them a little bit about you know, civic stuff. And, you know, and so I, I, they asked me, Daddy, where, where are you going? I said, I'm going to New Hampshire. Oh, I'm going to New Hampshire. I get up to the jack, my oldest son goes, are you going up there to vote for president? <laughs> so, so, I was really proud of that. It was, it was like, actually, actually, no, Jack, uh, but really good. Uh, no, I'm not going up there to vote for president, but I'm going up there to talk to people that are going to. Okay, and that's, that's a good segue into here. So Bob really scared you all with some lots of charts and figures and numbers. What I'm going to try and do is, is talk to you all about, the, given the fact that in New Hampshire, we do have outsized influence on who's going to lead this country, right? There are principles, right, you should be looking for when it comes to what a fiscally responsible campaign looks like. And I'm going to walk through, walk through some of those. I think six different ones is what I got. Uh, and I think I have more on our website if you want more, okay, at crfb.org. Uh, I'm going to walk through a few of these principles. Here's the first one. We need candidates that are going to be honest about the true scope and the nature of the problem that we face. Bob kind of laid out a lot of this in his figures, and here's some more stats, okay, if you didn't hear enough of it, to just drive it home and depress you further, okay? We're going to borrow potentially upwards of approaching $19 trillion over the next 10 years. Our debt as a share of the economy is approaching levels we've never seen in this country, right, except after World War II, and we're going to skyrocket past those. We're going to spend over $600 billion on interest this year. Interest is the fastest growing portion of the budget. We are going to spend more on interest in a given year than we do on defense in a given year within the next couple of years. Let's sit on, sit on that one for, for a second. Uh, and that's if the interest rate projections remain what they are in the Congressional Budget Office baseline. If they're 1% higher, we're going to pay a few hundred billion more on interest payments. So we need candidates that are going to be honest about the true nature and the scope that we face. Second principle, you should be looking for candidates that are making this a priority. And one of the ways they can make it a priority is they should have a plan. They should have a plan. And one of the elements that you could look for in a responsible plan to deal with this challenge is what is your target? Like what is your savings target? What are you actually trying to achieve with your plan? And what you're showing on this chart, I'm not gonna go through the whole thing, but basically, Depending on what your metric is, you can figure out how much savings you're going to need okay, over the next 10 years to meet that. Bob talked about the debt as a percentage of our economy being a key metric that we look at. If you want to, say, level off the debt as a percentage of our economy, say it about almost it's about 100% now. So if you got it 100% in 10 years, you're going to need about $6 trillion in savings to do so. If you want to go for a balanced budget, which is towards the bottom here, if you want to balance the budget in 10 years, it's going to, it's going to require upwards of $12.7 trillion in savings, okay? So you want candidates that are going to put forward plans, but when they do so, keep an eye out for how much savings and what their actual fiscal target is of what they're trying to achieve. Third principle, when they put forward these plans, 
keep an eye out for those that are taking options off the table, okay, <laughs> to deal with this, right? The scope of this pro problem is big enough that you gotta put all options on the table. What you're looking at right here, which dovetails to that previous slide when it comes to fiscal targets, is depending on your fiscal target, if you wanna stabilize the debt over 10 years, or if you wanna balance the budget, you start taking options off the table, it becomes incredibly unrealistic, okay, <laughs> in terms of what, what you're trying to do. For example, what this shows is, if you wanted to balance the budget in 10 years, it would require cutting spending across the board by over a quarter. Now, it's often the case that you hear candidates say, I'm gonna balance the budget. Uh, I'm not touching defense, I'm not gonna touch veteran spending, we're not touching Social Security or Medicare either, okay? If you do that, you're gonna require cuts of upwards of 75% over 10 years. There's similar dynamics there when you look at what it would be to stabilize the debt to GDP. You can do the same exercise on the tax side, okay? If you wanna balance the budget by raising taxes, 30% raise in taxes to do that in 10 years, okay? Or how about just those above 400K? 75 or so increase in taxes. Here's the bottom line. Those are unrealistic solutions and it's gonna require putting all options on the table on the spending and the revenue side to deal with this. Bob talked about in his questions for candidates about Social Security and Medicare. The other thing you want to be looking out for is are candidates putting forward actual ideas to address the solvency of Medicare and Social Security. Medicare is going to go insolvent Part A within a couple of years. Social Security is going to go insolvent within the next 10 years. There are given the very real okay political challenges of dealing with a topic like Social Security there are options out there. I can tell you that the policy community in Washington, D.C. knows what all of them are. You're going to have to address some revenues, some slow the growth of benefits, and you can make the program secure and sustainable for forever, okay? But it's tough, very tough politically. And what you'll often hear, as opposed to putting options on the table for Social Security, is you'll often hear people, again, taking them off. A common campaign tactic is don't touch it. I'm not touching Social Security. Well, if you don't touch Social Security, what you're effectively saying is that 10 years from now, you're endorsing a 23% across the board cut for everybody that, that depends on the program. We run an analysis on this. If you take a 23% across the board cut, translate what it means for income cuts, that would mean about a $17,400 income cut for a dual income family on Social Security. So keep an eye out for those that are saying, we're not gonna to touch Social Security. Next principle, I'm gonna step back for a second here and say, it probably wouldn't surprise you that it's come to the point that in Washington, action doesn't often take in place absent an action forcing moment, a deadline, okay, to deal with things. Here's the reality, coming up in 2025, whoever's president there and whoever gets elected to Congress, they're gonna have several deadlines and action forcing moments related to budget issues that if you're an optimist, which I'm trying to be an optimist on this stuff, can create an environment where there can be force some discussions on these issues that are needed. One of them is the debt ceiling. They're gonna have to raise the debt limit again sometime likely in 2025, which they just did this past summer, you may recall. You can't be irresponsible with the debt limit. You have to raise the debt limit. No one should be threatening default. It's really irresponsible to do so. But the other reality is the debt limit is often a marker where people step back, reflect on the fiscal situation, and can have some negotiations of what to do about it. Historically, the text got a little messed up here, but historically, there's been several instances where you've attached things to debt limit increases that make the fiscal situation better. There's been several where they've made the fiscal situation worse. But the fact that there'll be a moment out there means that candidates should be talking about, what are you gonna do about this, this deadline coming? And as Bob alluded to, another one is on the tax side. There are expiring tax provisions happening in 2025 that, you know, if you just extended them all, it's gonna add over $3 trillion to the fiscal, the, the deficit we already have over the next 10 years. So it'll force a conversation on the tax side too. So ask them, are you gonna have a plan to deal with these deadlines as they're coming up? And the last one, and then I look forward to uh, discussion. The last one is, Look out for various myths that are often talked about when it comes to these issues, okay? Uh, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but there are a lot of myths out there on these issues. Um, you know, 
tax cuts or big public investment programs will pay for themselves? No, they don't. They might, they're going to generate, in a lot of cases, some economic growth that might offset part of that cost. But they're not going to pay for themselves. We can deal with this issue by cutting waste, fraud, and abuse. Great idea. We should cut all waste, fraud, and abuse. But it's not going to deal with the big, big nature of the problems and where the real money is. Okay? And there's a range of other ones. So keep an eye out for those perpetuating various myths uh, on the campaign trail as well. Uh, with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up and look forward to your questions. I, I, I'll do a little plug here of some of our work at the committee where we have a whole project, U.S. Budget Watch, that is tracking, analyzing, fact-checking a lot of what the candidates are putting forward. And I encourage you to check that out as well. So with that, look forward to the discussion. Well, take a deep breath. Thanks so much for your informative, and I have to say, somewhat scary talks. Um, I have just a few questions to start us, and then we're going to open it up to the floor to the, for the audience. Um, and if you're watching live stream, you can submit your questions by email. You just email rockyqna at dartmouth.edu. rockyqna at dartmouth.edu. That's all one word. Um, let me start with just a very general question for, for either or both of you. Um, the U.S. federal government has been running budget deficits for more than six decades, my entire lifetime, except for a few years, in the late 90s, early 2000s, just, you know, three, four years. Um, the, and some people, including many members of Congress and a lot of people um, in the public, have acted like deficits and debt just don't really matter. Um, and your talks provide some really sobering and truly shocking facts. Honestly, I had no idea that interest payments were more than $600 billion in this past year. That's, that's mind-blowing. Um, why don't you think, why, why do folks just not think that deficits matter or that the debt is a problem? Why do you think it's just not on people's radar? Well, I'll, I'll, I guess maybe we can both take a shot at that. But, uh, you know, it's not like in your face. There's not like some action-forcing event that's like, you know, we were talking about, about uh, climate change and, and, you know, people seem to be able to understand the importance of acting now for, to protect the long term. Well, you have, you have wildfires and you have, you know, smoke from Canada coming down and polluting my air in Virginia. And, you know, you have uh, melting, uh, you know, polar ice caps and things uh, that you can identify and show a specific effect. And it's difficult to show, aside from, say, rising interest costs, uh, the specific effect on deficits if it's undermining uh, economic uh, investment and, and economic activity, uh, if it's, you know, making interest rates higher, well, it's, it's kind of a subliminal effect. And so it, I think it doesn't quite have that, uh, that immediacy that, uh, that a lot of other crises do. And I think, frankly, for me, the danger is that instead of a crisis, what we may have is a long, slow decline in standards of living because we're, future generations are going to have so, so much debt burden to carry, and we aren't doing the investing now in their future to help them carry it. Okay. Anything to add to that, Mike? You know, I, I would say um, that, you know, to build on what Bob said, I would say two things. First is, it's true, this issue is a little kind of abstract, right? It's like, it's, uh, you can kind of get it at a surface level, right? They're like, there's something bad about the fact that we spend that amount on interest, but people don't really understand some of the you know, macroeconomic reasons and other f fiscal flexibility kind of reasons. This is wonky stuff, okay? And then people turn it away and, you know, et cetera. So I think there is some, some of it is that. But look, the other thing is, um, it's not exactly appealing to folks that what the message is is something about where the solution is going to be we're taking things away rather than giving you. And this is a hard, <laughs> a hard message politically to state the obvious, okay? And so I think um, part of it is that as well, as people um, realize that, <laughs> right? And it's much easier to be th thinking about issues where they're gonna get, get something out of it as opposed to we're taking things away. That's reality. Yeah, good answers. 
Um, in the not so distant past, there was a very small but dedicated bipartisan group of US senators and representatives who worked together to try to rein in the US federal deficit. Um, and both of your organizations are nonpartisan and are based in the DC area, in part because that's where policy is made. Um, and I'm just wondering, are there members of Congress today who recognize the dangers of and the exploding debt and, and have the political cur courage to take that issue on? Yeah, Mike and I probably have very similar uh, answers on this, but uh, yes, there are. There aren't as many as in the glory days. I mean, I do remember when the Concord Coalition started, this was in the early 90s, there were all sorts of, there were almost like competing coalitions of Democrats and Republicans in the House and Senate that were putting together balanced budget deals or deficit reduction deals. And uh, I think what happened, you know, after we did have those four years of surpluses, uh, you know, people said to the Concord Coalition, why are you guys still around? <laughs> We've solved that problem. And uh, so I think, you know, some of that uh, urgency uh, fell away after that. But now you've seen, you know, particularly co post COVID, I think when you had like $3 trillion, $2 trillion deficits, and you see that after COVID, we've still got, you know, $2 trillion deficits that there are bipartisan members. We just, at the Concord Coalition, gave our Economic Patriot Award, which we do every year. We gave it to four members of the House who uh, we saw it have been working together um, on fiscal issues and certainly recognized the, the danger and the need for action. Uh, two of them were uh, Scott Peters and Bill Heisinger, who formed a coalition called the Fiscal Bipartisan Fiscal Forum, uh, working together, and they've introduced a commission bill and the other two were Jared Golden of Maine, head of the Blue Dog Coalition, and Don Bacon of Nebraska, who's uh, you know one of the uh, one of the Republicans who's serving in a pro uh, Biden district. So those four got an award. So I, I do think that there are some green shoots out there that mm -hmm. uh, that we might be able to help uh, nurture. Yeah, I, I, I haven't heard that term blue dog in about 15 years, so it's great that they're still <laughs> they're, around. They're, they're still there. They're yeah. dwindling, but they're yeah. still there. Uh, yeah, I'd build on what Bob said, and uh, it's, there's absolutely members of Congress uh, that understand how important this issue is and want to do something uh, to address it. There are also members of Congress that, you know, purport to really care about these issues, but they will, you know, perpetuate some of the uh, myths and different things out there about, you know, misleading ideas about how easy it is to solve this when it's not, right? Because I think that the, one of the bigger challenges of what I've seen taking place is, you know, you may have, sure, less people now than a few years ago that maybe focus on fiscal issues, but I think there's still a decent amount that do. I think that the changing do norms in our political system where compromise has essentially become a dirty word uh, in Washington, D.C. And you need to compromise to deal with these issues. And I think that is what is one of the biggest challenges uh, that we're facing when it comes to dealing with these, hmm. these problems. Um, so, you know, your presentations were pretty compelling in terms of the evidence of the need for, for a major policy shift. Um, and, and part of the challenge seems to me to be um, the complexity of both the problems and also the potential solutions. Um, you know, we live in a time where most people pay attention only to short tweets or maybe a 90-second Instagram. Um, many Americans are distracted or they're constantly bombarded by all kinds of information. Um, making effective sound bites seems a bit challenging for this area. Is there a way to distill the most critical fiscal issues so that the public and the media can pay more attention? I could start this one, Bob. I think that um, we have found, we've actually done polling uh, on this a little bit in focus groups and things like that, and the interest stats and things like that do resonate with people, right? Those do cut, those cut through a little bit, and it especially, <laughs> And recently, when interest rates themselves have actually been going up for folks on their, on their mortgages, on their credit cards and everything, then it even hits home a little bit more. So focusing on interest costs and interest stats uh, seems, to, seems to break through a little bit on this in the environment that you're, you're obviously uh, speaking to. But here's the other thing. Like, 
guess what? These issues are complex, right? <laughs> they are complex, and they go back to, we need a political system that's embracing the, the, the norm of deliberation and compromise, because that's what you need to entrust elected leaders to do. They need to embrace some of this complexity and come to agreement on some of these things. I know that's sort of a, maybe a pie in the sky idea, but I think that some of this is, uh, don't discount that it is complex and we need leaders that are gonna come together uh, and deal with it. The, the other thing that's coming up is uh, the pending insolvency of Social Security and Medicare trust funds, which will get people's attention. If you announce at the beginning of the year that Social Security is not going to have enough funds to pay full benefits for the rest of the year, that is going to get attention. That's what happened in 1983. The Social Security Administration said, by the way, we, we think we're gonna run out of full benefits by Ju you know, July or something like that. And so a commission was put together and people made some, some hard choices. I think that, and, and that's still about 10 years away, so I hope we don't just like do nothing for 10 years and you know, uh, fiddle around. And the Medicare trust fund date goes back and forth a little bit because that, that fluctuates quite a bit. Those are two deadlines that, uh, and, and also these expiring tax cuts. I mean, things that you have to take action on is a way, whether people want to or not, that they are going to have to, to deal with these uh, issues. So th those are action forcing events. Yeah. So um, we have a few minutes. I would love to open up uh, the floor to audience questions, uh, students, community members, faculty. Um, we have a mic and I ask that you, um, I think the mic is somewhere here, right? Okay, in back. Um, if you can raise your hand if you've got a question, or if you've got a question and you're a member of our live stream, um, just send an email to rockyqna at dartmouth.edu. We have a, a hand up over here. Thank you. Um, I'm curious because the questions have surrounded this and it's about getting people to actually care about this issue. Um, and so thinking about it, you guys are obviously based, I think, in DC area, right? Um, you're trying to get voters to actually care about this issue, it seems like, um, because clearly the leaders are not acting on it in the way that you guys would want them to. Um, say I'm a nurse and I'm a, a single parent and I live in a two unit house and my elderly parents live in the upstairs unit and they live off of social security, I hardly scrape by my patients, um, you know, have government assistance for their care and stuff like that. Why should I care? Why should I prioritize um, the, the amount uh, rectifying the debt that we have in this country? You know, two things I'd say on that, um, and I'm sure Bob will have more. Uh, one is those elderly parents on social security, the longer we wait, you know, the more at risk that those benefits are gonna be cut across the board. And frankly, the longer we wait, the, um, the bigger and more abrupt the actual inevitable changes are gonna have to be. So that's one thing I would say. And the second thing I would say is that a lot of the folks at the lower income end of the spectrum that are relying on various federal government programs uh, to support them, you know, those will become increasingly at risk if we don't deal with some of the, <laughs> the drivers of this. And so uh, those, they will be the ones that will bear, bear the brunt of this more uh, if we don't deal with our fiscal challenges. Actually, I, I agree with those things. That those are the points that it occurred to me that uh, you know people that are involved with government programs need to, whether whether as an advocate or as a recipient, uh, need to have a sense that the federal government's spending programs are on a sustainable track, that they can be financed, that the promises can be kept. It, it, it's not just Social Security; it's the other programs. So yeah, I mean, I think that that's that's the thing that people need to be concerned about with this is if you always have this fiscal pressure from rising interest costs and rising uh, deficits, something is gonna give. And unfortunately, um, those most vulnerable are often the first on the chopping block. I hate to say that, but that's just the way it is. We have a couple of questions. We have a student over here. Uh, hi. So there's a very popular view which states that as long as US dollar is still the global transaction currency, other countries will pay for the, basically pay for the, uh, our national debt. 
Um, that's why, in part, because that's in part why the quantitative easing has been a very successful strategy historically. So, how would you respond to this popular view? Thank you. Well, for one thing, uh, ne neither Mike or I are monetary uh, 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 policy uh, experts, but you're asking a question that I think is very important. I think it would be an enormous gamble and a huge risk, as a matter of fact, to assume that the U.S. current status is, is guaranteed, that it's some sort of entitlement and it's going to go on forever. I think we are the world's reserve currency because people respect us, because we have a credible system, we have a credible economy, we have a very good economy. If we put all of that at risk by simply saying, we're not going to worry about our fiscal policy at all, we're just going to run big deficits and, and you know, uh, keep buying our bonds to, to finance U.S. citizens' lifestyles, I don't think that's going to work for very long. But it, it still means that we are still here going to have to finance huge and growing deficits through the interest costs that are going to squeeze out other priorities even if, even if the world still wants to buy our bonds, uh, it still means that more and more of our taxes are going to go to uh, interest costs on the debt. So I don't think we should blind ourselves to the dangers of having an uh, unsustainable fiscal policy simply because we enjoy the privilege of having the world's uh, reserve currency at the moment. The only thing I would add to that, as I, I agree with everything Bob said, is, you know, what you're saying and others have, have argued is uh, various theories have put forward to, to try to argue that we, this isn't maybe as big a problem as people say. Right? And the reality is there's no free lunch. These are some, some types of these proposals are out there that assume that there's, there's a free lunch um, atmosphere on this. And I'll give you an example. Right? There were many people over the last decade or so that were pointing to the low interest rates that we had and saying, see, what are we talking about? We don't have to deal with this. Like, you guys see these big deficits or whatever. And now, well, those interest rates normalized, which they always were going to. And you're seeing the ramifications of that on the federal budget in real time, right? So my answer is that you definitely don't want to risk it is the main answer. But it's also be careful with some potential ideas that are more about just proposing that there's a, there's a free lunch. And just, just one more thing on the risk is that it's like jumping out of a plane without being, <laughs> knowing that your parachute can open. Because if we take that risk and we're wrong, it, again, it's your generation. And there will, be no, there will be no way to retract that. So I, I think, uh, to use a word that, that Mike is fond of with the budget, we should still, with that privilege that we have and that advantage that we have, still conduct a, a prudent approach to fiscal policy and debt. I have a question from our live stream uh, from a Dartmouth alum. For a person saving for retirement, and that's going to be um, even our students somewhat soon, um, what steps do you recommend for individuals to prepare for the reduction of Social Security benefits and the likely need to raise tax rates to deal with the deficit? Well, everybody should understand that Social Security is not intended to be the full retirement for everybody. So it's only intended to be you know, one part of a, a three-part stool. I will have to say uh, it has become the main source of retirement income for a lot of people or you know, for a very substantial part of the retired population. Uh, so I would say to everybody, uh, it is important to save for retirement. You don't need to assume that Social Security is not going to be there. It will be there in some form uh, maybe not playing out, paying out the full benefits that are promised under current law. So it's always important to, to start saving. Uh, and, um, you know, as far as uh, the, the, the taxes are concerned, well, I mean, the things that <laughs> it's important to have, uh, to have interactive conversations with politicians about the need to do these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A, Mike, Mike? Go ahead. Mike. No, it's okay. okay. We have a question over here. Uh, thank you, folks, for coming up. See, I've been uh, a resident of New Hampshire. I've been listening to candidates for president and Congress for about 35 years, talking closely with them. And I've never heard a single candidate, a viable candidate, ever 
propose a plan that actually addresses some of the elements required to address the problem. Never once. Congress has repeatedly breached its statutory uh, promises and efforts to deal with the problems, put Graham Rudman being the first one, repeatedly breached. Uh, we have a very conservative Congress now. They've put forth a plan that leads to us showing that $45 trillion uh, total uh, debt in, in 10 years. <laughs> so for that reason, a mutual friend of mine and, and you folks, Dave Walker, the former Comptroller General of the United States, uh, has formed an organization uh, called the Federal Fiscal Sustainability Foundation, which is organizing states, and this will be a question for you, organizing states uh, which have in sufficient number uh, submitted something called applications under Article 5 of the U.S. Constitution to Congress, in sufficient number, meaning two-thirds or more of the states, requiring Congress to call a convention for proposing an amendment limited to the subject of federal fiscal responsibility. So uh, states are teeing up. This, there will be litigation filed uh, shortly, within a few weeks, I, I know to be the case. Uh, it will, uh, we think, will prevail in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will order Congress to call such a convention first in U.S. history. So how will your organizations be involved? The states will then appoint delegates uh, to a convention for proposing an amendment limited to this subject. Uh, they will wrestle with, with the problem of, of Congress unable to deal with this problem itself without some type of constitutional handcuff. How, how will your organizations help the delegates fashion a debt to GDP limit or some other approach to fiscal responsibility? Uh, I, mean, I, can, I can start on this one. Um, and Dave Walker is a good, a good friend, and so I appreciate you bringing his name up. Um, yeah, what you're talking about, I believe, now I'm not as up on the exact details that we're talking about, but like, is an Article 5 convention. Okay, the idea here is uh, Washington's so dysfunctional, we've got to go around Washington, so let's use this provision in the Constitution that's never been used before to amend the Constitution in a way that's never been amended before that way through a, through a convention. Um, now, legally, I have no idea, honestly, Jim, of like the, um, the legal ramifications there, how close it is, or what have you, to, to what you're saying. And if it comes to fruition, <laughs> we'll probably have some meetings internally to figure out what we're going to do. But here's what I think. I think that, um, you know, the political system is as such that, I mean, I'm a little uh, pessimistic on the idea that we can't even pass anything by, uh, you know, what we can. To get all the states, which are also very divided, okay, to agree on something in a convention, because it has to go back to the states. And then they come in and, okay, what I'm focused on, too, is something Bob alluded to. For other reasons, I think one of the most promising things going on right now is many members of Congress that are coming together around the idea of establishing another fiscal commission. Now, fiscal commissions have happened in the past. I get it. Some have been successful. Some have not. But the environment is set up right now where you have leading senators, right, and, and prominent members of the House, too, with bills that are the same, that are live right now, to establish a commission to come together, force equal numbers, of Democrats and Republicans to sit down, no options off, on, off the table, and come up with a plan well in advance of that next debt limit increase, too, and these expiring provisions we talked about, okay? Um, I, I like that idea, right? Uh, you know, it has no guarantee of success, but it's live in Congress right now, um, and I think is a, is a, promising, um, a promising solution but I look forward to the meetings we'll have if that you know, convention comes to, to yeah, pass. Yeah, I think I just, I, uh, uh, I, I just say that um, I agree. I, I'm skeptical about such a convention, and I've talked to Dave about, about that, and he's, he's a great crusader uh, on this issue, uh, no greater fiscal patriot. Um, but I think that given the current environment, there are a lot of issues that people would like to have a constitutional convention about, and. Uh, assuming that a convention could be limited to fiscal policy, I think is, is a question that I have in my mind as to whether that could be done. Uh, anyway, um, if such a convention were to convene, I'm sure the Concord Coalition would be happy to talk to the delegates and give them this, <laughs> the slideshow <laughs> and that sort of thing. We don't, uh, we're not a lobbying organization. We don't endorse candidates. We don't... Uh, uh, lobby, lobby Congress, but we're happy always to talk about the issue with whoever is uh, interested. We could do a budget exercise. Yeah, we do. We get the, the we get the, uh, the yeah, okay. we get the delegates uh, acclimated. Yeah.
We have one last question, and we're going to have a question from Senator Robert Portman, right in the front row. Fitting, a fitting end to the session, actually. <laughs> well, first of all, what a, what a great session. And uh, thank you guys for coming and, and sharing your uh, expertise and, and some good ideas. Uh, a few things quickly. One, uh, to Jim's point, there are some of us working on a balanced budget specifically, um, mm -hmm. constitutional uh, convention. And, you know, the, the Bob Bixby said it well, there, there's some dangers inherent in calling a constitutional convention. It could get out of hand, and it could be a, a legal issue as to whether you could actually uh, do something good on the fiscal front. In the meantime, um, I agree with Mike. I think in the next week or so, we may be hearing more about a commission. And as Bob knows, I've been out there proselytizing on this. But the reason is the government shutdown is looming. And my own view is it's likely to happen. Um, I hope it doesn't, of course. And then there's a second potential government shutdown in February, uh, February 13th, I believe. And one thing that's been talked about is to come up with a plan that maybe more conservatives could get behind by saying that you would deal with the, as you saw in that figure, almost 73% of the budget problem is mandatory spending when you include interest in the debt. So it's about three quarters of the problem and it's the fastest growing part. And so I think a commission is not impossible because it's the only way to get at the mandatory side. In other words, all this discussion, all the back and forth we've been seeing has been about one thing which is a very small part of the budget. If you take defense out, which is more than half of discretionary spending, you're talking about you know, 12, 13% of the budget. But it's not really getting at the big issue. So I think Mike's right. I think this is hot right now, and those who are interested in it ought, ought to pursue it. I'd just like to end with something that's just okay if I ask you guys to comment on. You said at the outset that New Hampshire is you know, at the fulcrum here. You have the opportunity to help change the direction of the country uh, through your first in the nation primary. And uh, you know, Jim's point was no candidate ever talks about the debt and deficit. Uh, full disclosure, I'm here as a surrogate for Nikki Haley this, this week trying to help her because, and you know, I, I don't mean that to be uh, a, a clappable partisan point, but but she is but she is talking about it, and she is saying that you know we ought to raise the age of Medicare and Social Security, which is very brave actually. That's be for people who are younger, 40 or under. But that's as we saw in that chart. That's a very specific thing. She also was talking about more means testing. On the other hand, you know, if we end up with the Rematch of last time, we have two candidates who have, I think, made a vow not to touch Medicare or Social Security. Is that accurate? Yeah. So if you guys could just comment on that without taking a position, um, I think that might be uh, useful for this group. Well, I'll go first. I know, because uh, I know Mike's uh, organization has the budget watch that he mentioned there and probably have been looking at these things carefully. But to me, uh, this issue is going to require presidential leadership, uh, certainly presidential buy-in. And so if you have a president of either party that is saying that, uh, that they won't make any changes or they're promising no changes to these important but um, you know, facing uh, financial difficulty programs, uh, then I think it makes it much more difficult for other members below the presidential level on both sides of both chambers to step forward and do something very, very uh, consequential on these things. So I would, I would hope, um, you know, that a candidate uh, or a current president would at least give a commission a chance to give the uh, political cover to those who might want to make uh, these hard choices because they could shoot it down instantly. I mean, if, if a president is against it, it's, uh, it's not gonna happen. Uh, and so I do worry about that uh, from the two leading candidates. Yeah, I mean, I think that with the, with the caveats that as, as, as an organization, we don't endorse candidates or uh, support candidates. I mean, look, uh, Senator Portman is, is right that uh, there are candidates on the Republican side who have been very brave to talk about things on Social Security that are really hard to talk about, okay, in a in a presidential campaign, or any campaign for that matter. And, um, and so Nikki Haley deserves credit, in, in, in my opinion, for that, as does Chris Christie, who has also spoken about such things uh, as well. So that is really important for the reasons Bob said, that uh, to set up for success, starting to show leadership during the campaign makes sense. Now, here's the deal, with the caveat here too. Like, 
we're not political consultants, but any political consultant is going to tell them to start putting out all these detailed plans that are taking things away from people is not going to be helpful. Okay, <laughs> right? So look, it's a balancing act, but they have to, you know, show where they stand, and not to be a broken record. But it is really important to look out for. Don't box, your, box yourself in by taking options off the table. President Biden has had this pledge that he's not going to raise taxes for anyone below. 400,000 and then he kind of boxed himself in there of like you know well, what does that really mean like would would like a would a uh, gas tax kind of count on that if you kind of adjusted that or how about this carbon tax or uh, or how about changing deductions here that maybe some like it just it puts you in a box so the more people are don't take op options off the table is a way to show leadership on these issues too all right, well, unfortunately, I would love to go on and on. It's a, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, this has been incredibly insightful. Thank you so much for making the trek during the, our, our fiercest winter <laughs> storm to date this year. Um, and thank all of you for, for attending um, and learning a little bit more about this really vital and important issue. I used to work at the IMF. And I joke with my students, it stands for it's mostly fiscal, and I honestly believe that. Okay. Um, just a shout out that um, there's going to be another Rocky event right here tomorrow at 5 p.m., Joanne? Yes. At 5 p.m., Christina Wong, who's a political comedian, um, is doing a number of events on campus, and she'll be here um, in the Hinman Forum for some Q&A. Um, so come if you're if you if you want to laugh after having this session we may need a little levity right um, there are some glimmers of hope I heard with the Commission there are right. glimmers of hope anyway thanks so much for coming out really appreciate it thank you so much